Welcome to online lecture number 14. Last week we spoke a lot about rates of reaction and towards the end of the week we learned that many reactions proceed stepwise. So for instance this nucleophilic attack here on acyl chloride produces in the first step a reactive intermediate and this reactive intermediate then via a second step produces the products. So the energy landscape for this process is plotted here. In order to produce the intermediate, first you need to overcome the activation energy, then you have an energy minimum again for the intermediate, and a second activation energy then governs the formation of the products. Right? So this is a stepwise uh, process, and the rate limiting step here was the first step because its activation energy is high, while the activation energy for the second um, uh, step is very low. So another example was the oxidation of um, methanoic acid uh, by, with a bromine. And we found that this is a reaction that proceeds stepwise. The oxidation is actually not uh, the protonated methanoic acid, but the deprotonated methanoic acid by the bromine. And for this to form, first the methanoic acid needs to be deprotonated to form the uh, conjugate base and only this one then reacts in a second step to form the products and we actually we were able to obtain a um, rate equation for this process by just looking at these individual steps so the aim of this week's and next week's uh, material is to develop like a general understanding of reaction mechanisms and learn how to write them so, so let's learn a little bit about these reaction mechanisms. So I just told you that many reactions proceed stepwise and they produce reactive intermediates. Here's an example. This is a bromine attached to a carbon that has um, other groups, R groups, which could be any um, functional group. It could be a methyl, an ethyl, an alcohol group. We keep this open here so we don't define what R is. Um, now, in order to describe this um, stepwise reaction, we use a so-called curly arrow notation. And the curly arrows indicate the movement of electrons. So for instance, here I draw such a curly arrow, and this arrow indicates that the two electrons from the sigma bond move to the bromine. And as a result, the bromine can split off as an anion it has basically stolen one of the electrons from the carbon now and the carbon is left behind um, with an empty orbital here and we call this now a reactive intermediate and it is also planar which is indicated by these um, symbols here that indicate the three-dimensional um, or organization of the molecule. So this here indicates that this is a planar molecule, which has an unfilled molecular orbital. And now the reaction that continues to happen with this reactive intermediate is determined by the stability of the intermediate. And the stability of the intermediate is determined by so-called steric or electronic effects. So we will talk about those more this week. So now, a nucleophile like this hydroxide could attack this uh, carbocation, as we call it, to form a product. So this is a carbocation, this is an electrophile, because it takes the electron from this nucleophile into hydroxide, is a nucleophile, it is interested in the positive charge of the electrophile, basically, of the carbocation here. So the reaction, if the um, uh, reaction proceeds now, it produces an alcohol in this example. So the reaction kinetics or the rates of reaction, that's what we spoke about last week. Um, understanding those is, is useful to, to, to figure out um, how fast do reactions proceed. The other field of knowledge, the th thermodynamics, the equilibrium, the second law of thermodynamics with the Gibbs law, uh, Gibbs free energy. This is what we discussed about before. 
Now, so now we talk about the reaction mechanisms um, that are often determined by the stability of reactive intermediates. So before we go into more details, let me make a few definitions. First, I define what are polar reactions, ionic reactions. So for polar reactions, we use this curly arrow notation, an arrow that has two lines at the head. And the two lines correspond to the movement of a pair of electrons or two electrons. So, and these polar reactions often they um, involve ions. So here is a, a covalent bond between A and B. Now the two electrons that make this covalent bond, they both jump to B, um, maybe because B is more electronegative for instance, and this process causes this covalent bond to be broken and we call this heterolysis. It results in the formation of a cation and an anion. Right, these are now, for instance, they are reactive intermediates. And the anion, or also the cation, but let's look at the anion, it can continue to react with another cation none, now, to form a new bond. And this is called heterolytic bond formation. Right? The resulting product is again a neutral molecule. So, they are not only polar reactions, they are also so-called radical reactions. And for those, we use a different curly arrow notation. It's not much different. The only difference is now that the head of the arrow has only one line. That means only a single electron is moving. And it doesn't involve ions, but it involves radicals. Right? So here we have an example, A and B connected via a covalent bond. There are two electrons in the bond. So one electron jumps to A, the other electron jumps to B. It's called homolysis. It still causes the bond to break, but you don't form ions now, but you form radicals, a radical A that has an unpaired electron in an orbital and a radical B as well with an unpaired electron. So these radicals, again, they are intermediates. They can now react with other radicals to again form covalent bonds. And this is called homolytic bond formation. It also results in, again, in a neutral uh, molecule. So these reactions um, can first, we, for instance, we have either homolysis or heterolysis that produces these intermediates. They, the intermediate can be a, a, an anion, it can be a cation, or it can be also a radical with an unpaired electron. And those intermediates continue to react either directly to form a product or indirectly via a second intermediate to form another product um, or another intermediate that forms then the final product. And for each of these steps, we have separate Gibbs free energies of activation. Right? They are not the activation energy, but they are the Gibbs free energy of activation um, involving also the um, entropy of, this, of the process. But let me tell you a little more about reactive intermediates. What you see here is a tetrahedral sp3 carbon hybrid. So remember about hybridization. So the carbon has um, a filled s orbital and uh, three p orbitals of which two are filled. But the electron from the s orbital can jump into one of the p orbitals and then four um, hybrid orbitals can be generated. So these four hybrid orbitals here, they are called sp3 hybrids. And hybridization, it allows um, us as chemists to um, describe the three-dimensional um, organization of the molecule. So in this case, it's a so-called tetrahedral organization. So these dashed lines and this triangular line and the normal line, they indicate the three-dimensional distribution of the functional group ar around the carbon. So the rest here, for instance, it goes just vertically up. This goes like to the back and this goes to the front and this goes down to the, to the right. So this is now a molecule with a functional group and the bromine it is slightly more electronegative than the carbon and that results in a partial negative charge on the bromine. 
And the partial negative charge simply means that the electrons in this sigma orbital, they are drawn towards the bromine and that in turn causes the carbon to be partially positively charged. Right? So now because of this, it is possible that a heterolysis happens so that both electrons from the sigma bond jump to the bromine. And as a result, you get a bromine anion. It basically it stole the electrons from the carbon and the poor carbon here is now a cation. It has an empty orbital um, and it has also formed a plana sp2 carbocation now. So you see this uh, reaction has resulted in a three-dimensional change of the shape of the molecule. So it went from a tetrahedral to a planar molecule. And you can express this now in a sp2 hybridization. So only these three sigma bonds are now hybrid orbitals, but this uh, orbital here is a regular p orbital. So, and it is empty, it has no electrons in it, um, and therefore um, it's hungry and eager to, to, to find a partner that would allow it to have electrons in the orbital. So the carbon itself in, in, in the tetrahedral sp3, it has three, um, um, sorry, it has four valence electrons, right? And together with the valence electrons of the functional groups, it has eight valence electrons. So here the carbon has only three valence electrons, one here and one there and one over here. But together with the functional groups, it has six valence electrons. So it is missing an electron. It's a vacant p orbital that has formed from a um, previously from an sp3 um, orbital, so, and that has resulted in a shape transformation of the. So talking a little more about um, heterolysis, here's a different example. This time there's no bromine as a functional group, but we have uh, just a hydrogen. And now the carbon here, it can have a partial negative charge. First, it's slightly, slightly more electronegative than the hydrogen, but also these uh, uh, remaining groups here um, can cause this polarization to happen where we end up with a partial positive charge on the hydrogen. So now with this, a base, a very strong base, can attack the partially positively charged hydrogen and steal it from the carbon, resulting in the electrons from the sigma bond to jump to the carbon. And we have then a carb anion. It's a negatively charged carbon molecule. The negative charge is now because the um, electron from the hydrogen has been dumped into the or sp3 orbital here um, and, SP and now we can also maintain this sp3 hybridization, right? But so we, we still have this same shape um, with um, um, eight valence electrons, um, but instead of a um, carbocation, what we had before, we, we end up with a carb anion. So, but it's, it doesn't have to be a, a pyramidal sp3 carb anion. It can also be a plana sp2 carb anion. So that would again result in a change of the uh, 3D shape of the molecule, where we end up in a plana configuration, um, which of course also has eight valence electrons. But now, whether you get a pyramidal sp3 or plana sp2, entirely depends on these residual functional groups here, which can inter their, their molecular orbitals can interact with the uh, molecular orbitals of the carbon. And depending on this interaction, you get either the pyramidal or the planar. And we'll talk more about this later. So here is an example of a homolytic uh, or homolysis. So now again, partial negative charge of the bromine can cause this bond to break and then if it's homolysis, the electrons distribute. One electron jumps into the carbon, the other jumps into the bromine. And um, in, uh, we usually get then a planar um, uh, carboradical and a bromine radical. So the, the, the shape of this molecule goes from this 3D shape to this planar shape now. And we have 
one um, lone electron in this p orbital that has formed from this previously from this sp3 orbital and the whole uh, reactive intermediate the carbon reactive intermediate has now seven valence electrons and now we are at the end of this online lecture and i summarize it by showing you again the different reactive intermediates that have been formed either by heterolysis or homolysis so if we spoke about the plana sp2 carbocation with an empty p orbital here or we also spoke about the pyramidal sp3 carb anion where the sp3 orbitals remain and the uh, 3d shape of the reactive intermediates is the same as the one from the reactant it could also be that this um, uh, uh, cap anion has a planar configuration um, with a p orbital filled uh, by a lone pair. And last, we spoke about homolysis, um, where a planar carbon radical can be formed, where we only have this um, p orbital that contains a, a single electron. So this is called a planar carbon radical. So now these reactive intermediates. They continue to react to form products or a next reactive intermediate and how fast this happens um, or the activation energy for this it depends on the stability of these um, of these reactive intermediates and the stability of these reactive intermediates is often called by these residual groups here um, and these residual groups they can introduce so-called electronic or steric stabilization mechanisms. And we will talk about these uh, stabilization mechanisms in the next uh, online lecture. See you later.